moment I can depend on to bring me happy. Welcome back to a Captain's Log. I'm Brian Kreutz, the ambassador to Trekkies everywhere. Next to me is the Lily Fox Lim, maybe Ooh. known as the biggest Trekkie I know. <laughs> oh, hey BK. It's an honor to co-captain this ship through over half a century of Star Trek shows, movies, news, fandom, and lore. <laughs> oh, the honor is mine, <laughs> Lily Lils. By lore, did you mean Data's android nemesis brother or the secret knowledge surrounding the Star Trek universe? I did. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Nice Trek knowledge, BK. Uh, yeah, I meant the second one, but it looks like you might might take the spot for biggest Trekkie. Ah, you're too nice, Lils. But the spot for the biggest Trekkie might have to go to Jeffrey Mando. Why is that? Well, last week, Doug Drexler told us that he met Jeff when he was only 14 years old in New York City. Mm. Jeff came into Doug's Star Trek store in New York City, called the Federation Trading Post, and oh. showed off his blueprints for the Klingon Battle Cruiser. What? He did that at only 14 years yes. old? Okay, it looks like we have some competition. <laughs> should I keep my phaser handy? Yes, I think you should. <laughs> we, well, we, we don't want to start any unnecessary conflicts among the crew, like Gene Roddenberry's always said, but instead, maybe you could use a transporter and bring him onto our Enterprise or Federation ship here in Pasadena, California. <laughs> Then we can have a battle of wits during our tractor beam meet section. Oh, BK, you're such a peacemaker. <laughs> Are you sure you're not an Enar male? Can you read my mind? <laughs> no, I'm simply mortal! I wish I had telepathic abilities like the Enar, but I definitely wouldn't want those two huge antennas sticking out of my head. But I think I can guess what you and the audience are thinking right now. Enough banter. <laughs> I want to hear more from Doug in the world of Star Trek. <laughs> Maybe you are an Enar. Well, <laughs> speaking of banter and Doug, last week Doug Drexler shared a lot of funny memories he had on the set of Dick Tracy and the tons of Star Trek projects that he worked on. That's right, Lily. I still can't believe he and Jeff snuck onto the backlots of Paramount. I mean, talk about a fully functional outside functioning fully outside of normal parameters. Unbelievable. Was that last line uh, an attempted LOL reference? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Doug worked on the makeup for LOL, Data's daughter. That's right. Right again, Lily Lils. Doug said doing makeup work for her, LOL, was one of the most memorable fun times he had on the show, The Next Generation. So cool. What an experience. You know, now I'm thinking about using that transporter to sneak onto the back lots myself. <laughs> <laughs> I wish you the best of luck and that you live long and prosper. But for now, we still have another half an interview with the Academy Award winner, Doug Drexler. Yes, you're right, BK. Besides, maybe Doug can provide pointers on how to navigate the sound stage. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but for now, there's still lots of news in the world of Star Trek that our fans simply cannot miss out on. That's true, BK. Now, as Lau would say, we are functioning within normal parameters. <laughs> Let's blast off into Trek news. Well, we all know Star Trek is alive and well, having been showcased on Paramount Plus and CBS for the Super Bowl. We saw Star Trek icon Sir Patrick Stewart appear in two Paramount Plus commercials. Also, Anson Mount and Ethan Peck appeared as well, with no dialogue. However, they were still there. More new Trek episodes are right around the corner on Paramount Plus Thursdays with the two, two. premieres, two premieres two. for Star Trek Discovery <laughs> Season 5. <laughs> Set to premiere this Thursday, April the 4th. Fourth. <laughs> We're all sitting next to our TVs at 10 p.m. Pacific time here on the West Coast to get to that disco premiere early. Yeah, it's sweeter that way it versus is. the media pass previews in advance. <laughs> <laughs> Come back for more in store with Doug Drexler here on A Captain's Log. A Captain's Log returns in a moment. Let's welcome Academy Award winner and jack of all trades in the artistry escapades, Doug Drexler. <laughs> welcome to A Captain's Log. BK, you have a next gen and Voyager question for Doug, I believe? I do, Lily, yes. 
Now, DS9 was not a heavy location show. However, the next generation of Voyager had so many sets on the sound stage and on location shoots, particularly at Griffith Park in Los Angeles. Can you tell us an episode or memory that you have where you had to create a scenic artist replication of a planet or recreate a specific <laughs> shot originally on location, then make it look realistic on a sound stage? Tell us how this worked collaboratively with the DP and the director. There were a few times where they had a set on stage. I guess this was probably Enterprise, where it's them walking through the wreckage of a city. And the set was torn down. And so I had to recreate it in the computer to do a shot from up here. Stuff like that, you know. Um, DS9 was mostly graphics for me, you know, although I did branch out into prop design and some set design. But as far as recreating something from an exterior set or a standing set where it was missing, only a couple of times, I guess. You know. mm -hmm. So it wasn't too challenging, it sounds like, then, to have to recreate something like that. Well, I mean, it's always challenging because you could do a fantastic job. And if it doesn't look fantastic to Rick Berman, you're going to have to do it 10 more times and you don't understand what was wrong with the first one. <laughs> <laughs> I see. But, you know, it's never been about what I want. I think if you come out here and work in this business and are upset because they don't see what a genius you are, you're definitely in the wrong business. Mm -hmm. It's all about trying to find something someone else wants. That's, you know, that's the trick of it. The magic of it, you know. Mm -hmm. And that's why a lot of people can't do it because, that, you know, it's too much. You know, I'll have people who come out here and work a couple of years and go back to somewhere else, wherever they came from, you know, and say, oh, I can't. They're so phony and fake and plastic out there. I just couldn't take it. I'm like, wow, you are so full of shit. What really happened was that you couldn't take it. <laughs> <laughs> Reason why... It's so phony, and I'm such a person of high moral, you know, fabric. <laughs> I can't work there. You're such a liar. <laughs> How do you resolve that problem artistically that would translate cinematically? I mean, like when you're in the art department, you're going to get, you're going to go look at it on stage before they shoot, and then the next morning you're going to have the dailies to look at. Right. But, um, you know, where you're doing a makeup and you look through the lens and you see something wrong, I could go in with a sponge and some color and stipple over that to break up where the light is hitting too hard. I could tone it down. It's not the same with, with a, a graphic. I mean, once the graphic is in, you can't go in and touch it up on stage. You know, you learn something for the next time, but you're mostly going to live with what you have at that point. Um, Makeup was more flexible in some ways because you could still adjust it as it was being shot, you know, in real time. Doug, you've made quite a few cameos on the Star Trek series over the years. My favorite one was Transfigurations on Star Trek The Next Generation where you could wear the Star Fleet <laughs> uniform. Ah. That was June Haymore, who was Patrick's makeup artist, really made that happen. We really liked each other a lot and she was wonderful. and. Um, and I guess she went to Brad Jacoby and said, is there any way you could put Doug in a uniform in a scene? And, um, oh, no, it was David Livingston. She went to David Livingston, and David was awesome. And next thing I knew, they had me slotted in for this shot and sent me to wardrobe, put me, you know, Bob Blackman. <laughs> Bob comes in and sees, because he knew what a geek I was. Sees me in a Starfleet uniform and goes, the dream comes, you know, and uh, shooting that was, of course, being in that, I wore one of the skin tight spandex outfits. And it's like being naked. <laughs> you know, I mean, they could count how much change you have in your pocket if there were pockets, you know. Uh, but I was in great shape. I was more than ready for that shot. I was very proud of it. Um, not anyone can wear one of those. Later on, when they had the jackets, they were more forgiving. But those uniforms were like painted on, painted on in front of all your friends now, you know? <laughs> yes. You're in the red. You're in the Starfleet red and 10 forward. And uh, it was great. 
Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, the thing was that when that aired, we were on our way to Disney World for the world premiere of Dick Tracy. And so the guy who was in charge of bringing us out there, I said, look, I'm doing a cameo this week while I'm traveling on Next Generation. Is there any way you guys can record it? And the guy at Disney World uh, had their central command role, the video is, recorded it. And they brought me into their control room and it was like on 12, 12 monitors. It was awesome. It was a good week. <laughs> Crazy. Yeah, that was awesome. That's so cool. Uniform, so it's a thrill, honestly. And, and, you know, I was in uniform again in um, the last enter episode of Enterprise, I guess. Mm -hmm. But I've also been on Battlestar Galactica. I appear as like a hangar deck person, you know. <laughs> I love seeing Star Trek cameos from the great people behind the show like Doug. Absolutely. <laughs> Tell us about the on-camera opportunities in a Starfleet uniform and who allowed you, to, who gave you that opportunity to appear in the, in the first place. Nobody who works is going to ask for that. Mm -hmm. It takes someone else who knows how much you want to do it and talk to somebody else and say, you know, there's any way. Well, I mean, on that last scene of Enterprise, they were just based, the word just came up to the, I think Michael Kuda said, do you have any interest in being in the scene? Manny Cotto is going to be in a uniform and, and you know, uh, uh, Dave Rossi is going to be in a uniform. And um, uh, of course I want to do it. Of course I want to do it. Um, I'm supposed to be there. People that yeah. do like you can't that kill Trip. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's insane. <laughs> Why would you kill him? Well, nobody dies in science fiction. I was on the Shuttle Pod show a few weeks ago, and we talked about that. And, I mean, Trip is a great character. I love Trip. I do too. I think my very favorite Enterprise episode was um, Similitude. Mm hmm. Where Trip is injured, and Doctor Flox has this like papaya with veins on it. Yeah, and it grows. And we can grow a new Trip from here, and then farm the organs that we need. <laughs> and this new Trip, you know, you fall in love with them, and he falls in love with Tapal, and Tapal thinks he's wonderful, and now they have to kill him to take his organs. <laughs> Woo! Yes, Trip Tucker dying in Enterprise for the finale was almost a jab into our hearts as fans. And then the series, of course, had to end. Oh. It all happened so quickly. Oh, and Enterprise was mm -hmm. my favorite. I know. This was a senseless death on Enterprise, and the show went before its time yeah. as well. It did, yes. Very moving. You know, when you have a show that moves you, original series Metamorphosis, uh, City and Edge of Forever used to be my all time favorite episode. But then as I got older, Metamorphosis started making me cry every time I watched it. Yeah. You know, where he falls in love with the companion. The original series episode, Metamorphosis, was very emotional for me as well. Director Ralph Saninski explained to me over the telephone, the panning left shot with the companion moving over to Zephram Cochran was into a symbiotic relationship moment. To me, that was brilliant. That is. His realization mm -hmm. as he's going through the show, at first he's disgusted. You know, um, Denise Okuda feels the same way. Metamorphosis shakes out as being the most moving after 57 years. Back with more and Doug Drexler here on A Captain's Log. A Captain's Log returns in a moment. Thank you for trekking with us on the one and only broadcast television source for Star Trek news and interviews. Welcome back to A Captain's Log. Hollywood and Los Angeles are the epicenter of entertainment in the United States. Star Trek is no doubt at the center of science fiction's finest and long-running series in both film and television. Doug Drexler has an enormous set of multiple contributions to Star Trek's ever-enduring run. So let's get back to our discussion. Absolutely. Now, Doug, your work on Star Trek The Next Generation, you received two Emmy Award nominations as makeup artist. The last one was in 1993 for the episode The Inner Light, but let's go back to 1990. This was a big year for your recognition, including Dick Tracy. Let's talk about the episode Allegiance on The Next Generation. Please describe the recreation of these four alien creatures. The first one, Starfleet Academy Cadet Haro, Isak, and Koval 
fall were all very custom heavy makeup rules. Mm -hmm. You worked tirelessly on makeup, developing the look of the abducting aliens on the Enterprise D bridge. What was it like doing makeup for them and how did it feel to be nominated for an Emmy Award for your work? The thing I remember about that, it was gonna be me doing one of those guys and John Caglione doing the other one. And the morning of, he couldn't make it, which is really tough on a TV show. And so Mike Westmore says, you're gonna have to do them both. And I basically had the two of them in two barber's chairs. And I would work on this one and they'd go over and work on this one. And then work on this one and they'd go over to work on this one. And then put the piece on this one and they go over. And I was doing the two of them like, you know, um, the thing was that they were very funny guys, hilarious. And so we were laughing all the time. Um, I think we were nominated for an Emmy for that. Yes, it was Jeff Rector and Jerry Rector, who were twin actors from St. Louis, who played those abducting aliens. Rector boys. They were twins? Yeah. Oh, my God. There was no good reason for, me, for them to be twins, but they were. Because you couldn't see them anyway. <laughs> it's like zucchini heads. But they were really, really funny, hilarious. Um, yeah, I, I would love to have gotten an Emmy for makeup, but I got a couple of nominations, and it was the few times where Trek didn't get it. Well, we did Inner Light, which I put the makeups on Patrick. You know, they were designed by Mike. More. Let's talk about the Inner Light, the Emmy Award nominated makeup you were up for. What was it like to work with Patrick Stewart, aging him, and other stories about makeup that you may want to share on Star Trek The Next Generation? To work that closely with Patrick over a period of days was fascinating, you know. Um, and he'd be like pointing at a dot. <laughs> Look, here, here. <laughs> I'm like, man, if they could see that, we should all go home right now. You know, he was an interesting character, very interesting. Not like any of the others, but ended up being just like them. You know, the more time we spent around Jonathan Frakes and Michael Dorn and, you know, Brent Spiner, who were just big jokesters, kidders constantly, you know, um, he had to. In Inner Light, where there, he's laying on the the floor of the D bridge, you know, unconscious. I thought the three of them were on the floor rolling around wrestling and fighting and wardrobe was like freaking out. You know, there's the the Q episode where I had to make up his butt. You must have heard that one, right? You had to. Um, Mike Westmore says, um, they don't have a body makeup artist. He gives me some pancake and a wet sponge. Go to John Delancey's trailer and you get, make them up from head to toe so there's no blemishes or anything. And I just remember him on the phone arguing with someone. He hardly paid attention to me. He had like a G string on. They just like, raise your arm, raise your arm, raise your other arm, you know. That, that. It's like being licked by a big St. Bernard. And then when they brought him in, they needed him on stage. The second AD comes in, we need John. And uh, you go in through the heavy stage doors and it's icy cold in there because they keep the air conditioner full blast because of all the lights. And he has this scene where he's on the bridge like buck naked. Red alert, red alert. You know, he loses his powers. And um, the director was John Landau. Not Landis, Landau. Not John, Les, John's brother. John Landau was a producer for uh, on Dick Tracy and J and was J has been James Cameron's man for feels like decades. And uh, I knew him and he saw me come in with, the funny thing was that whenever I came on stage, whenever Michael Dorn saw me, he would blurt my name very, you know, with a Klingon inflection, Drexler, 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 loud, always, never failed. And, um, LeVar, always, always, even in the middle of the street, the middle of Studio City, would have to stop and go, ladies and gentlemen, Academy Award-winning makeup artist, Doug Drexler. So I come in and they're going, they're doing that. And I see Les Landau listening to it and thinking, thinking they're treating me so special. 
And I look over and I could see the mischief in his eye and I'm thinking, uh oh. And he walks over to Delancey's butt and goes, make up and points to a spot on his ass. Delancey's rehearsing his lines. He's not even, he's oblivious. And I'm like, okay. And I take the sponge and I'm like, on Delancey's ass. And Les Landau turns to the crew and says, ladies and gentlemen, Academy Award winning makeup artist Doug Drexler. It was the whole crew went berserk. It was hilarious. Um, well, I'll never forget that. Doug, uh, please share any stories, either positive or challenging, surrounding the Paramount lots and working with influential Star Trek pros like Gary Hutzel, Dan Curry, or perhaps Rick Berman. <laughs> Boy, there's one that really comes to mind, but <laughs> I was really mad at Dan Curry. You know, we had done this Enterprise episode where Malcolm, I guess, was out on the hull where a mine had attached itself to the ship. And Dan wanted to shoot the green. We built a section of the hull and Dan wanted to shoot the green screen stuff, but no, the camera angles and lenses and stuff. And he came up to the art department and I used the computer to set up shots with all the camera information, how high off the floor, what angle it was at, you know, what lens. And it really worked well. Um, although I always hated that because it made our people look stupid. I mean, really, we went out into space. We could do warp drive, but we weren't prepared for uh, something on the surface of the hull. You know, I mean, Malcolm had to trudge halfway across the hull with, you know, tool cases when we always planned that the ship had like window washing cars that could take you anywhere in the hull, but that made it too easy for them. Um, so anyway, a few episodes later, there was one where we had a village looking down from the top of a cliffside. And we did, Dan wanted to integrate live action with CG and we did the same thing. And this time I get called to stage and it's not lining up at all. I have no idea why. And now Dan basically left me with these guys who were looking to blame someone and went off and had a cup of coffee. <laughs> I could see him over there talking to someone and I'm like, uh, people all around me, camera people, second unit people, AD, stuff like that. And I felt like I was being thrown to the wolves there. But, you know, I'd been through quite a few things at the, even at that point. And I realized as long as I act like I'm in charge, they will all fall back and do whatever I say. And it was totally true. I was like, I put a stop to everything. And I said, hey, I don't care how it happened. What, how can we make it work? And I, and I just had to make a decision. And I said, pick up the scaffolding, move it back 10 feet. Let's set up the shot. And so I, I made a judgment call and it actually, now it lined up. But it was like, I was like, Dan, where are you? But on the other hand, why not let, you know, he just left it to me to deal with. I remember it being very uncomfortable, but I remember being impressed <laughs> that I took command like that, you know? And yet, I mean, you know, uh, Jerry Lewis, right, comedian, he was a filmmaker and he taught a class at USC, I guess, back when he was big. And um, they turned it into a book uh, called The Ultimate Filmmaker. He didn't write the book. It was all based on his classes. And he had Spielberg and John Landis in his class. And, and the thing, I read it. When I was in tenth grade, maybe, and I remember something that Jerry Lewis said was that when you walk on set, change something immediately to 
assert your authority. Designing the Enterprise NX-01 was no small feat. You received credit through, throughout Star Trek Enterprise in the early 2000s, and how do you feel about practical models versus today's computer-generated imagery and technology? Or what advice do you have for the next generation of graphic or makeup artists breaking into the business? I mean, you can't beat CG ships. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Can't be beaten. I mean, we had, there was a physical model of first season on Orville because probably John Favreau, who directed the pilot, said, I want to do a physical model. Any other director they wouldn't have listened to. But the truth is, is that the physical model ended up being put in a crate and never used again because it can't compete. The closer you get to it, the worse it looks. With the CG model, you can keep up resing it wherever you need to go. You don't have to worry about lights burning out. You don't have to worry about, listen, the Orville is shaped like a pretzel. And after a couple of years, it starts to twist as the material begins to shrink. You don't have to ever worry about that with CG model. You can do any kind of shot you want on a CG model. You don't need the Teamsters to go get the model, set it up on a stand, you know, can't compare. I mean, I was lucky to live through the that era of physical models and the transition. And everyone lo loves a physical model. Who doesn't? You know, I mean, you know, I mean, I, I love it. You know, everyone wants that. But it just doesn't compare to how flexible a CG model is. And they look so good, depending on who the artists are and who's a visual effects supervisor, things can look very different in subtle ways that the average person doesn't recognize. But, you know, um, and besides, pretty soon AI will do it all. You won't even need an artist, right? You'll just say, I need a space shop, kind of like John Eaves, and it'll spit something out, you know? It's, uh, listen, it's a great tool, uh, but of course the problem is that people who are in the union, who are designers, want to be involved from the get-go. And now what you could do is go to AI and ask for some groundwork imagery that you don't need anybody to generate. See, that's the problem now. Like people, I mean, same with actors too. You know, uh, the smart to be thinking about it now because it's coming really. You know. It's on its way, like Santa. Doug Drexler, thank you for being with us here on A Captain's Log. We've learned so much from your stories. We have, Lily. Lily and I will see you next week for another fantastic set of news and interviews here on A Captain's Log. Bye for now. Help me, my old friend. I'm glad you've manifested yourself into a human I can depend on to bring me happy.